So I'm going to do a cross score on them to help them split open and then give it one minute. And some of these will have bruises on them. They're a very inexpensive peach and a lot of them are beautiful. And look at the size of that peach and this one looks like it's pretty good. A little bit of a bruise here and that's about it. But that's a three-quarter pound or something all by itself. By having them refrigerated, then when you put them in there, it does lower the temperature of the water, but the peach doesn't get cooked. So that's nice. At least that's the way I like it. And then into the ice cold water, which, hmm. into the ice water to cool that off and stop the cooking. And I just do three or four at a time so I don't get too far ahead. But if you've got more people, you can do a little bit more at a time and zip through them pretty quickly. Okay, and then after those chill for just a teeny bit, then the peels come off pretty well. And if they're nice and ripe, comes off real well. Okay, now I'll go over here. On this particular batch, I'm going to try slicing them using that spam slicer uh, that we got for strawberries. And I'm going to add a bit of vitamin C or, or ascorbic acid to it uh, before I put them on the cookie sheet. So I'll get this with a decent amount, kind of sprinkle a very small amount, mix them up, and then put them on the cookie sheet. So I have not tried it this way. Oh. And we'll remove any kind of bruising, of course. There we go. And then kind of split it down the middle of the peach, right along the suture line. Push it apart. And if it has a split pit, uh, then it will usually have some pieces in there that need to be removed. Otherwise, we'll just push the pit out. Make sure that any of the skin off the bottom is taken care of. Now let's see if this will work in there. Oh, that's nice. Nice even slices. I wish I'd have thought of that earlier. That's beautiful. Look at that, nice even slices. Oh, it's a goldfish. Oh yeah, I really wish I'd have thought about that on the previous ones. We've already done 30, 40 pounds, no more than that, of peaches and didn't think about using that for the slicer. And if they're underripe, then that's not going to work uh, because it won't be strong enough. But if they're nicely ripe, like, like these, I think these will work out great. Again, remove any of those. And when I cut it along here and then kind of give my knife a little bit of a twist, opens up a gap there, put my finger in, push the one side away with the knife. And this knife isn't a particularly sharp one, so hopefully I won't cut myself. Okay, and there's an example of a split pit, but it wasn't a badly split one. Sometimes they're split pretty badly. Okay, and so you can see right here, that's where the edge of the pit was, and that needs to be removed. Oh, I forgot that I should be playing to this camera. <laughs> yeah, so that little piece there, that was the edge of the pit, and it will be kind of hard and crunchy, and I want to remove that. And then there's a little bit around the stem area that sometimes is harder to get out when you peel. And so if it has any of the piece of skin there, I like to remove that because usually that means it's a little bit harder still. Now, put that in there. And nice slices. I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of the vitamin C in there, powder, the ascorbic acid. And this is a half teaspoon, 
and I don't think it needs very much. So, and then I want to be very gentle with these, of course, because I don't want to break them up. And I'll sprinkle the rest of this on as I go. What did we learn about this? I think we learned that you can use this if they're very nice and ripe. So add that little bit, the rest of that half teaspoon. Kind of toss them very gently. Again, I don't want to break them up and mangle them. Then we'll get them on the cookie sheets like it did before. <laughs> so those, we'll get those into the freezer for pre-freezing and then when it's their turn, they can go in the freeze dryer. In the meantime, after they're frozen, transfer them to zipper bags. Right, doing the next batch of peaches, and these are those thin peaches that we just sliced with the Spam Slicer. Of course, for me, it's been like four days ago. And going to use gloves again because these tend to get a little bit sticky. And these trays are going to be kind of lightly filled. They're not going to be very full because I didn't make very many, uh, we didn't cut very many peaches on this one. Uh, get our tear weights on there. So I started the freeze dryer a little while ago. It's nice and cold already. It's time to get the peaches in. So let's go get the peaches and get them on the trays. Starting with tray four on this one. And get a piece of parchment paper on there. And these are the ones that I pre-froze. So I'm going to put one cookie sheet's worth on each of the freeze dryer trays. So tray four is 1452 and I'm going to add a thermometer and I'm just tucking it between a couple of the layers of peaches it'll give us some information all right same thing with the other ones the tray three and usually I would have had these all off of the trays and into ziplocs but I didn't get around to it this time I'm not going to worry about it Okay, 1435. So this batch that I'd added the a little bit of ascorbic acid to, they look fabulous. These definitely are the best looking ones I've done so far this year. Fourteen twenty-eight. And this one looks like it's probably the lightest one of them all. All right, let's find out what this last one weighs. And it's only 13.55. So this batch is quite a bit lighter. It should freeze dry quite a bit quicker. Those are marvelous. Now, in they go. Starting at the bottom. So this batch of peaches is a light batch of peaches. There's only about 5.9 pounds. Uh, the batch I had two batches ago in this one was six, uh, just about six pounds. So this is slightly less than that one. Um, this one's also sliced thinly and more evenly. So this should freeze dry quicker and more evenly. So this should be ready in less than two days. And the temperatures have finally started to drop a little bit here at night. So now it's getting cooler at night. So perhaps this area will cool down finally. Uh, this is the hottest I think it's ever been since we built this house uh, inside the basement. It soared way up into above 75. Going to let this finish freezing and then it'll start freeze drying and we'll see you back here in about two days. So don't go away, it'll be just a second. All right, I'm back. It's the 25th of August. It's been a couple days since I put the, the peach slices in there. They were supposed to be done about four hours, four and a half hours ago, but I'd given it three extra hours last night because I knew I wouldn't be up in time to get them out to check them. So now, um, let's get them out, check them, see if they're already dry. And we'll check to see if they're dry by weighing them 
putting them back in, giving them two or three more hours, and see if it loses any more weight. If it doesn't lose any more weight, then they're probably dry already. So let's get them out and check them. So I'll bypass the additional time that I added, just using the down arrow. Then I'll open the drain valve. And as soon as the pressure is equalized, we can get them open. Okay, starting at tray one. And those look great. Yeah, those really look marvelous. Okay, so tray one, and it's a very toasty tray. 853, and I'm going to rotate the positions as usual. 860, and I'll put this one on top, and bring this one down a spot. 850, and of course this bottom one, this bottom position tray is cooler as usual. 864, and I'll put this one up a spot, and that one down a spot. And we'll get it restarted and give it another two or three hours to double check it. So at this point, it's had two extra hours beyond the extra time that I'd given it last night. So the timer here is showing about 40 and a quarter of hours. It should have been 38 and a quarter hours, but I got sidetracked this morning. I knew I couldn't get to it. So I added two more hours this morning. Now let's get the drain valve closed. Okay, so adding more dry time, and I did close the drain valve, continue, and I don't worry about that. So you can see it took three and a half minutes, including all the adjusting. And I'm going to go ahead and bump this up to three hours, and I can add more. Um, and I could add more time later if that doesn't turn out to be enough. I mean, for me to get back to it. So if I get sidetracked or working on something, I can just bump it up and add more time while it's running. Otherwise, we'll be back in two or three hours. So don't go away, it'll be just a second. I'm back. It's been just over three hours. I added a couple more minutes on there so that it wouldn't stop until I could take them out. So they've been cooling for almost 20 minutes already. So it's right on the borderline of where I would consider it still to be safe to take them out. All of the tray thermometers still show over 90 degrees. The, the bottom tray, which is always the coolest, uh, shows about 90 degrees right now. That means the tray temperature is probably colder than that. So let's get them out and check them bypass the rest of that we'll open the drain valve as soon as the air pressure is equalized we can get it open so tray one and it's still warm it's still slightly above body temperature i didn't bring a thermometer down to check it so no change which is always the only answer that we will take before we take them out is that there was no change during that test period or so extremely low that they were sure that it stopped okay no change on that one tray three and this tray is noticeably cooler especially in the back it's definitely starting to cool down okay and no change and tray four and also no change okay so i'm going to stop the machine using no defrost and we'll get these moved away from here quickly so that the cold air pouring off of here doesn't start to get these cold and starts to condense moisture on these so we'll get these moved over the machine shows almost 44 hours on the timer on this machine, uh, but we know that it was done somewhere between 38 and 40 hours or earlier. But the last time that we added was to do the dry check. So now we can back it up to before that 
and count that as our time. So I'm going to use the 38 and a quarter hours as the dry time or as the how long it took that batch to dry. It was a smaller batch. They were thinner pieces. I would expect them to dry faster than that previous thick sliced batches. Okay, so now uh, the power usage. Oh, first we'll get the defrost baffle into place. And we'll get the fan in place. And we'll, we'll turn the fan on when we don't have to listen to it. Now the power usage. So that batch took about 27.99 kilowatt hours to finish. And we'll get it reset for the next batch. And we'll get the thermometers out and get the final weights. And we'll kind of pop them apart. And they're not stuck together too much. And it's interesting that this tray ended up with more of the ascorbic acid in it and you can definitely tell a difference. And this was definitely a light batch. So let's find out how much we have left. So it's 844 and of course we have to subtract out the tray and paper but we'll get that in a minute. And two. 852. Tray three. 841, 856. This batch only had 5.9 pounds to begin with, but I'm going to put it in six bags and call it about three quarters of a pound each. Uh, it's actually going to be slightly less. A pound after freeze drying would be about 68 grams per pound, which is the same as about three batches ago. Uh, per pound for the peaches. And then for one sixth of this, it'd be 67 grams. So that's how I'm going to use that. It'd be 67 grams per pound bag. And then I'm going to use three quarter pound bags, which is 51.1 grams per bag. So I'm going to call these about three quarters of a pound, and I'm going to bag them in bags of that amount. So then each three quarters of pound have lost about 284 grams of water. So we'll get some labels printed and we'll be right back with those. Again, I'm calling it about three quarters of a pound. It's actually slightly less, but that's close enough for this. I'm going to go ahead and add more label stock to the printer. So I'm going to open the top up because I only have one label left in there. I'm gonna go ahead and add a stack of label stock. So I think I need to put this on, or this on a, a little bit higher level. I think that would help for, for this part of it, but I'm not too worried about it. Let's give it a test. We'll do one test print. Okay. Okay, good. So then I need a total of eight of these. So I'll do three more labels. Okay. Yeah. Let's go get them on the bags. I'm labeling the bags with a sticker label and I have the batch number in case for some reason this goes bad. I know people are concerned about the fact that I'm trying out thermal labels and I'm concerned also. I've heard too many stories about thermal labels becoming invisible or gone or uh, you can no longer read them. I don't know if that's all of them or just some kinds because I have an entire folder full from when I built this house that date back 20 years. So they are from 20 to 15 years ago, this range of hundreds and hundreds of receipts and other kinds of labels with many hundreds of them being thermal prints. Every one of them is still legible and most still look pristine after 15 to 20 years. So I'll wait and see how they go. But I do have this number. I can always refer back to my paper notes 
uh, for what that batch is and all the information about that batch because that's how I'm getting this information to begin with. So I am aware of it and I am concerned about it and I've got my fingers crossed that it's going to last long enough to be useful. I'd love to have a little laser printer of that kind of size or a thermal transfer type label machine. But I want that kind of size and price point and price per sticker uh, that this gives me. So I need about 51 grams or just over 51 grams per bag. All right. So there we go. 51.1 grams. Uh, it's just about three quarters of a pound. It's a little bit less, but that's what I have for this batch. So that's how I'm going to do this one. Mostly I just wanted to break a piece off so I could eat it. These are so much better than the peaches we did last year. Wow. I've got those bagged in eight one-quart bags. I'm going to add a 300cc oxygen absorber to each one of those. And this particular bag had seven left. So I'll use all of these and then one from a different one. I'll tuck the oxygen absorber down the side to keep it out of the zipper area and the closure area. Okay. And I'll get those zippered up first. Oh, doggone it. You fool. So I'll get these zippered up. And these are fairly full because these are a little bit small of a bag. So I'm just gonna kind of work my way across the top and because of the fragile nature of those peach slices some of them will end up getting broken uh, as the oxygen is absorbed and that bag shrinks down a bit they'll still be fine for snacking and they'd still be fine for smoothies and things like that get one more oxygen absorber and that sensor right there you can see how fast it turns bluish or purple Get that one in there, and I'll throw this other sensor in there also. We like to keep the extra sensors. I should put them in bags at some point. The problem with putting these sensors in these bags, and the reason I haven't yet, is because they turn so fast, you could never open the bag and get that sensor out and find, find it and get it out before it's already turned anyway. So it's kind of won't work. I just realized that when I do some of the uh, ones that I use for short-term storage and they're clear on the front. I could use that I'll have to remember next time I could put a sensor in this type because then I could see the sensor huh. Wish I'd have remembered that earlier. So these sensors will go back to the other color in a few hours Okay, I'll we'll get these sealed And get them ready for storage and as always Trying to seal at the very top edge of the bag, but still get the full seal width. Okay, so I've got it sealed real close to that top edge with room for two or three more tries in case I mess it up. Or in case I want to open it and use some and then reseal. With peaches, I probably wouldn't take some of the bag. I would probably empty a bag or two. It's probably a good idea to test your heat sealer every once in a while. And we do on a fairly regular basis just to make sure that everything's still functioning. So this is just a piece of one of the bags and all the edges cut off, but the inside layer is still touching the other inside layer. And then put it in there same way he normally would. Do the heat sealer, let it cool for a couple of seconds. Take it out, make sure that it's cool or let it cool for a few seconds. And then check it, make sure that it is indeed sealing. There should be no gaps. There shouldn't be any uh, weird lines. It should be one 
line of that whole width that's sealed. And if it doesn't, then there's a problem. Okay, I'm going to take another piece of it and cut the seal edges off. Again, now I have two separate pieces and I'm going to turn the machine down quite a bit and check it at a lower setting. Okay, normally on my machine, I'm running it at about a seven for these heavier bags, six and a half, seven. And now I've turned it down to just three, but I'm still going through the same process. And if you look at it, at first it looks like it's sealed, but it didn't. Okay, going to five. Okay, again, looks good. It looks like it's sealed, but if I pull, it was only sealed at the two ends. Five and a half on this one. I'm gonna to move to a fresh spot, make sure that that's not causing an issue. Okay, again, it looks great. You can see the waffle print from the, the textures here. Looks fine. And at first it kind of looks okay, but you can see that groove, how it looks like it's dipped in there a little bit. And if I push my finger in there, it only sealed at the two edges. It did not seal all the way across. Now I'm going back up to all the way to seven, which is where I usually use hours. And then let that cool for a few seconds. And it looks virtually the same as the previous ones. But when you do this, you can see that straight line, there doesn't seem to be a gap in the middle of there anymore. If I try to push my thumb through there, it's not lifting in the middle. If you really try to pull it, I don't know if I can do this. Okay. You can see the the whole bag material is starting to stretch. It's starting to break apart here, but the seal is still complete. Anyway, once in a while, just check your sealer to make sure that it is actually still sealing and not just look like it's sealing. One last thing before I store them away, as usual, I'm going to add a gross weight to the bag. So, going to put each one of them on the scale, 75, and write the weight on the bag of what it weighs right now. That way, if I've done a bad job of sealing, or if it gets punctured, or if it's a bad quality bag, over time, moisture will go through there faster than normal. It'll get heavier, and I can tell. The contents of this is just over 50 grams. So one gram of extra weight would equate to 2% water by weight. And we'll get all of these labeled. And if it's going between two numbers, then I'll take the higher number. And as soon as those are all labeled, we'll be ready to put them on the shelf. And maybe it would be better to use a more sensitive scale like the one that I use for bagging, or maybe even a balance type to make sure that you could always be positive. But so far we haven't seen any issue except for the one time that we bought the bad bags. We were low on bags and saw a good price on a different brand of bag that was thinner. Well, it turns out they were terrible. They let moisture go through. We had to reprocess everything 
and we did lose a couple of bags. Because we knew the weight of, of all of the food on the trays, we were able to reprocess them and find out how much they lost during that. And it was up to two or three percent. Anything that was higher than that, we threw out. So we lost a little bit of broccoli and green beans. Um, and I, my sister, I think, lost some eggs that she did. Anyway, I'm not going to chance it. I'm going to use the heavier, better quality bags. And I'm going to put a number on there so that I can tell if I want a spot check. I can go back and check them. These are ready for storage now. The peaches from batch 639, yep, 639, are going in bin 43 with the peaches from the last batch. And then onto the shelf. Taxi! That still relieves room for at least another half a batch, maybe more. So these are ready for the shelf. Now, all right. So this bin ends up going in this rack here. So I've got three levels of racks. Oh, can't really see that very well. Yeah, it's not a great place to get video. There's not a lot of room there. The whole thing is set up in a very small space in the corner of the basement. So this is our freeze-dried rack system so far. We've got three rows of racks, so we've got two of them back to back. And to get them out, to get the second row out of these bigger ones, we actually have to pull the first one out and then pull the second one out because there's not enough aisle space behind that to get them out through there. Um, and we simply don't have room to move this rack out without encroaching on the doorway space. So uh, it works. We just have to pull it out from this side. And we've got 40 bins on these first four sets of racks, two in the front and two in the back. And then we've got one more rack, one more set of racks. So one rack is mostly freeze dried and the other rack is other storage things. A little less than half of the back two racks are freeze dried. The rest of it is freeze dried stuff from the last six years. Though there's almost nothing from six years back. There's, I think I only have 50 or so bags left from six years ago. Those are things that we use for rehydration tests uh, to use them up and test them out. So we can test out how the things are holding up after six years. So that's the maximum length of my data. I don't want to use everything from the oldest because I want to see how it continues to hold up. And then in the computer and on printed copy, we know what's in every bin. So if we want to, we can, we can sort by food, by date it was bagged, or by uh, bin location. So we can find everything in this bin or everything that was done in November of 2021. Or all chicken. So we can sort it any way we want. But for now, that's what we've got for our bins.